All right, listen, we're going to uh, kick this off today. Uh, for those here in the room, thank you very, very much for uh, for joining us. I know we have a fair amount of or large footprint here online as well. I'm Chris Sharman. I'm the director of the uh, China Maritime Studies Institute. Uh, really do appreciate your time and, frankly, your investment uh, coming here today. This is an incredibly important topic. I'm joined today by two great academics uh, who are very practical in their research. Let me just do a brief introduction to both of them before we kick off. Um, Dr. Hugh, Hugo Bromley, a research associate at the Center for Geopolitics at Cambridge. Uh, a little interesting nugget on Hugo is, first of all, he speaks with a wacky accent from across <laughs> the pond, so that you'll have to work through that. But he's a historian of British manufacturing, and I'll let you get into a little bit of how that fits into this topic today. Uh, Dr. Ike Freeman, uh, to my right, is a Hoover Fellow at Hoover Institution uh, and uh, out of Stanford. He's an, really the crowning achievement of his academic pedigree is that he's a non-resident research fellow of the China Maritime Studies Institute. That's what he likes to tout when he goes anywhere. Um, so today we're going to be looking at an absolutely fantastic and fascinating topic. I'm not going to do it near the justice, but you know, we get into a con let's say the hypothetical, we get into a conflict with China. What is our economic contingency plan for the potential if we are in a conflict with China? It's, I'm going to let these guys talk to kind of where we go and how we navigate this. But uh, they have been on a road show talking to a fair amount of people. Uh, I think they're going to speak for about 30 or 40 minutes. And we have some time afterwards for questions. I think you'll find them incredibly engaging. So I'd encourage you to uh, to uh, ask a lot of questions at the end of this. So with that, let me turn it over to Hugo and Ike. Uh, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And just to echo what was said at the end there, we're going to speak for a little bit and then we're going to open things up and it would be brilliant to have them the fullest and most productive discussion possible because there's a huge amount of expertise in this room and we want to learn as much as as much as talk. Okay, is this the, the clicker thing that makes it move? That, that's the one that makes it right. move, but you're going to flip over and, the and as has been said, my accent's kind of funny, so if you can't understand it, let me know. So we begin, if we can make this thing run. Is it running? You good? Should be just safe. Try flipping now. There, there we go. go. So we begin with this, which is from December 2023, and is from the US Select Committee on the CCP. And it is basically the problem that we have, which is that across the US and its core allies, there has been a lack of serious thinking about contingency planning for Taiwan crisis scenarios. And really we're caught in a binary. On the one hand, we have people who just don't wanna think about this issue, who don't wanna think about the consequences of what a Taiwan Straits crisis could do to the global economy. And on the other hand, we have people who are used to the same playbook we have been using for 30 years, what one might call Russia Plus, right? The suite of financial sanctions we've developed, we developed them in a multilateral context since 2014, they've been being used against Russia. What we're trying to do with this work um, is start a conversation that can break us out of that binary and find contingency planning that advances the broad suite of US interests. So we're gonna do this in three parts. We're going to talk a bit about the theoretical work we've done on economic coercion. What is it? How does it work? What is the history of it? What are you trying to achieve? Ike's then going to talk a bit about where we are now, where we are in terms of sanctions, where we are in terms of China's understanding, where we are in terms of what we could do. And then we're going to outline the plan we discuss in our report as a starting point for further discussion. So understanding economic coercion, it's all about markets. There's a market from 1750, as has been said, I'm a historian of British manufacturing um, from the early modern period to the modern one. And we're gonna be circling back a little bit to those days as we go through. There are, however, basically two things you can do with economic coercion, and it's helpful to draw a distinction between them. You can weaponize your own market. In other words, economics exchanges in, to some extent within your own sovereign control or you can, you can attempt somehow to interdict and restrict global trade flows. Historically, the way you do that is you put a bunch of ships on a global trading lane and you blockade something. The other way you can do it, and the way we've got used to doing it, is by restricting access to what, has been, what have been called central nodes of the global economy within your own national market on which the global economy depends. This is sanctions, right? You take something like SWIFT and you say, we're restricting who uses it, even if the both parties in the transaction 
are not within our own market. And there are these two different ways of, of, of moving. The difficulty you have, you have is that whenever you try and draw a line through the global economy, reaching far beyond your own market, or even inside your own market, prices move and market actors will adapt dynamically. None of this is new, none of this is exciting. If you try and restrict the supply of something to a place, its price will go up, demand will go up, and people will want to fill that demand at a higher price. And the people who will do this fastest and facilitate this trade most are neutral countries across the community. They are going to think of ways round your blockade or your restriction or even just ignore you and trade through. And then you as the coercing power looking to global trade, you can do what you want in your own market, that's your national control. But when we look to global trade, you have what we think of as the choice. You can escalate and you can risk further escalation with neutral nations, or you can conciliate and try and reach an accommodation. Historically, most states do both at once um, with varying levels of success, but you are always because of the market incentives, going to be over time put into that binary. And it was thinking about this and thinking historically about this that caused Ike and I to posit a very simple theory, which is that if your strategy involves reaching beyond the national market to interdict and manipulate global trade, the larger the community of economic states economically, the harder your economic coercion becomes. Because the more people are going to be trying to exploit those arbitrage opportunities and the greater the potential costs to you of escalation against that neutral community. There's some really big lessons of this in terms of historical case studies. And I'm going to get to that as we go through. Because whether we like it or not, the very concept of neutrality as it exists in international law and international relations was created to facilitate trade through economic coercion. This is Catherine the Great, looking very Catherine the Great. Um, we go right back here to the war that created the country I'm currently standing in, um, during which America, the American Revolution, was supported by France. Britain didn't like that very much and imposes a blockade on trade into France, mostly in naval stores. In fact, masts, ships, tar, mostly from Russia. So Catherine and certain allies of Catherine create the League of Armed Neutrality with the fundamental principle that contraband is defined narrowly and their own states get to trade through blockade without search or seizure. This is the first serious attempt. Neutral rights have already cut they date back to Grotius, right? They're in the international law of the sea, but this is the first serious attempt to establish state neutrality as a principle in international relations. It works, by the way. Britain concedes that Russian naval stores are not contraband unless the trades are into France. Fast forward to the Napoleonic Wars, and we have exactly the same thing. We have a second League of Armed Neutrality. When the French Revolution breaks out and Britain tries to intervene, the initial idea is to restrict foodstuffs into France through economic coercion to pressure a settlement. Um, that lasts three months before pressure from neutral states and Scandinavia forces Britain to concede that grain can trade through the blockade. They try again to insist on naval stores. What starts happening is not only a ship sailing through, but um, neutral states are using their own navies to convoy merchant ships through the blockade. Uh, there's a couple of instances called the Freya incident that you can Google if you're curious. This culminates in the battle you can see here. Nelson does his thing. However, once again, Britain concedes that naval stores are not contraband. Why? Because the economic size of the neutral community is very large for Britain and it needs access to those markets. It can't risk continued escalation just as much as neutrals can. This is a fun one. This is the American Merchant Navy um, during the Napoleonic Wars. You can see and the revolutionary Napoleonic Wars, it booms. War in Europe is really the origin of the American Merchant Marine. Um, it's used to trade with both sides. Britain uses it to trade past the continental system that Napoleon sets up. Um, French use it to trade past British blockade. This is one of the primary causes of the War of 1812. Um, which actually caused number two. Um, you'll have some historians talking about other things, but the essential point to remember, I think one of them might have addressed, the, addressed this, this group at some point, but the essential thing to remember is that the incentives towards trade with neutrals 
were enormous, consistent, and ran through this process. So that's the only modern stuff done. But I want to dwell a bit on the more modern side of things and World Wars I and II. And in the early stages of those two world wars, blockades really struggled. There was a, I, I think Nicholas Lambert has spoken to this group occasionally in the past. There was an initial idea of strong economic warfare that is set aside due to domestic pressure and above all pressure from the neutral United States. Navasert system fails to restrict food imports via Holland. Scandinavian countries continue to trade. British dreams of extending economic coercion fall down. However, and this is the point I really want to emphasize, which is, is, is maybe one to dwell on. We are talking about a time of imperial systems when the neutral community, the relevant neutral community is tiny. There are a very small number of neutral states and most of the resources of the planet after the first globalization are controlled by six, seven states that are all at war with each other. So once the United States enters, the size of the neutral community is minuscule relative to, the, to, to global trade. And that allows you to push further and do things like force accommodation, compulsory purchase agreements, things that happened towards the end of World War I. It looks like the blockade was effective. It wasn't. It was embargoes at an imperial level, which when supported by the United States, do start to have an effect. Same thing with World War II. This is a photo of a train. It is a train going across the Trans-Siberian Railway. It is shipping American raw materials to Germany via Russia. This was something that happened consistently until Barbarossa. Why? Well, it's not because America is somehow out to get the United Kingdom. It's because of those fundamental economic incentives about price. Um, quite often what was happening was that American raw materials would backfill Russian stuff that then could, could then go on to Germany. This rendered the British blockade in World War II basically irrelevant in terms of meaningfully in, um, impacting supply. You can do some things, but it got to a point, and I've read these documents and they're extraordinary, where immediately before the fall of France, the British plan was seriously considering launching air raids on Soviet oil, field, oil fields just because the, the extent to which the blockade is failing to function as it is supposed to function. Again, once the United States enters, once Russia enters, we're in a time that is an ideal moment for economic coercion because of those imperial systems. I'm gonna end this before I hand over to Ike. We live in the inverse of that now. We've been through another great globalization, but the size of the potential neutral community is larger than it has ever been in world history. So if we're thinking about economic coercion, if we're thinking about economic contingency planning, we need to think very differently. So where are we? Well, about two and a half years ago, Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. And before he did, uh, the US administration threatened sanctions like you have never seen before. We were told that this time would be different, that the United States had this capacity because of Russia's interconnections with this global financial ecosystem, uh, the rails of which run through SWIFT and CHIPS, the, the systems that are used to message and settle international transactions. And we were told that if the United States managed to shut China, uh, Russia out of those systems, including by sanctioning the assets of Russia's central bank, that Russia's economy would implode. So how's that working for us? In this chart, you can see Russia's inflation rate in orange. You can see the exchange rate, the ruble dollar exchange rate in green, and you can see the interest rate in blue. Basically what you do if you're a central bank is when inflation rises, when money is pouring out of your country, you raise interest rates. So people can get a better return in your banks. So they keep their money in your banks so your banks don't collapse. Raising interest rates is not fun. It makes life harder for a lot of people who want to borrow money. But in the short term, it's a very effective mechanism for preventing your banks from collapsing. So look at what happened. We imposed sanctions within two weeks after the invasion, the toughest sanctions that had ever been known we seized or froze half of the assets of the Russian Central Bank, an enormous quantity, $300 billion of assets. Russian inflation skyrocketed as Russia faced shortages. And what did the Central Bank do? It took a bunch of common sense steps. It said, can't take your money out of the country. Can't take your money out of the banks, except in very small quantities. Here's a higher deposit rate as an incentive to keep your money in the banks. 
and so on about six or seven other steps like that. And then what was our follow through? There was no follow through. We had thrown at Russia everything that we were willing to throw at Russia. Now, in principle, we might have done more. We might have tried to shut down Russia's exports of oil and gas, but we didn't want to create mass shortages of oil and gas because we didn't want American consumers to be paying $10 a gallon at the pump. And so what happened in essence is Russia survived the initial financial gut punch. It did not collapse. And look at where we are two years later. Moscow's fiscal position, the, the revenues for the Russian state are doing fine. In fact, depending on how you look, they're almost up from the pre-invasion average. And if you calculate the inflation adjusted income, the, the, the actual take-home pay, meaningful take-home pay of the Russian households, it's up. Russian households are doing great under this regime. So it's possible that some of these efforts will degrade Russia's ability to fight over the longer term. It's throwing sand in the gears by making, pay, making Russia pay a little more for machine tools or this or that. But this toolkit is not causing Russia to collapse anytime soon. So imagine with that context, a day one moment over Taiwan. Imagine whatever scenario you like, an invasion, a blockade, even a quarantine that seems destined to escalate. Imagine how financial markets would respond. In 1914, the best analogy we have, trade, international trade was 22% of the global economy. Today, it's around 57%. China is integrated into every supply chain in the world with only a very small number of exceptions. A kinetic conflict in the Taiwan Strait would probably disrupt merchant shipping for a period of time because no one would get insured to sail through a conflict zone. And then there's the additional question of what the United States would do on the economic side that might compound the pain. Uh, when World War I broke out, the financial system was caught in a position of paralysis. How many months did they close the stock exchange for? Was it eight? I think it was eight months that the stock exchanges were closed. Uh, this would be a moment almost without precedent. So it's useful when we're thinking about the deterrent value of the sanctions threat to ask how experts in China are thinking about this. And we don't have perfect insight but based on open sources using a methodology that was pioneered here, here at CMSI, uh, we can begin to piece together what Beijing is thinking. In work which is not only summarized briefly in this report, but which I have forthcoming separately, uh, a colleague and I work systematically through the debate. And what we can see starting in 2018 and intensifying towards the present is a growing realization in Beijing that there could be a sudden rupture that the United States might try to throw this sanctions book at China and that China has to get ready. What are they doing? Well, they're learning a lot of lessons from Russia and they're suggesting many of the reforms and policies uh, that are either things that Russia did or things that Russia should have done. They're diversifying their, uh, their, their, their dollar stockpile. They have essentially a, a piggy bank of assets in various currencies. They're reducing the share of those that are in dollars. They're moving some of them out of the control of Western countries where they could be frozen in a crisis. Uh, they're consolidating the financial supervision, the regulators to make it easier for them to pounce and prevent the banking system from collapsing if we do the sanctions gut punch. They're doing the obvious stuff. Bottom line, they are very aware that we might do this in a crisis that they provoke or even they fear in a crisis that they don't provoke. But they are also increasingly aware of the historical trend that Hugo has just described. That in general, when one country tries to interfere with neutral countries' ability to trade with a major trading economy, they anger all the neutrals and end up escalating the conflict and not in their favor. So I just want to reflect on a couple of points to just imagine in a bit more detail what this day one moment would be like, because these are the assumptions that Hugo and I will build on uh, in our uh, policy recommendations. 
We call this scenario a break glass scenario because we're not imagining any particular thing China might do. And we're also imagining a world in which we're not necessarily doing sanctions. But what the scenario that we're imagining is one in which China does something that's sufficiently beyond the pale, that there's a bipartisan consensus in Congress, we have to completely reset our economic relationship with the PRC. Specifically, we have to deal with this global financial shock. We have to, in the short term, as a matter of urgency, finish de-risking all of our critical dependencies on China's market. And then in the slightly longer term, we need to do something that will bring back all of our non-critical dependence, all of the kitchen appliances and shoelaces and all the rest. So we'll deal with the critical stuff first. We're going to do the crisis response that we have to do, which is the Federal Reserve doing its thing and maybe Congress doing its thing to prevent American, American economy from collapsing. But we're going to have to break our dependence on trade with China. And in this context, there's two challenges which almost go in opposite directions, which we have to balance. The first is our short-term interests in the immediate crisis. And then the second is the long-term challenge that China is presenting to the global order by crossing our red lines, by precipitating a conflict that may well become a kinetic fight. So just a couple more points before I hand this over to Hugo. Um, I think it's important to think systematically through our national interests in that context. Obviously, if China starts a conflict over Taiwan, especially if China fires first at U.S. forces, there's going to be a tremendous political push to throw the book at China. But punishing China, while it might be an interest, is not going to be our only interest. The U.S. is going to have this short-term interest in preventing the meltdown of our own financial system, in making sure that we don't have another Great Depression. We're going to have an interest in breaking our dependence on China's market and helping our allies do the same as we've described. We're going to want to preserve a functional rules-based trading system for this post-conflict era, because even if we're not trading with China, we will want to trade with the UK, with Mexico, with Vietnam, with other folks, including some who may want to be trading with China. And we're going to need a system that can deal with that. That requires reimagining these institutions we have. Uh, we're going to want to sustain the position of the dollar in the international system, even if we don't want to put sanctions on China because we're going to need to enforce our existing sanctions and export controls on North Korea, on Russia, and so forth. And because we're going to want to make sure that the really critical stuff, the dual use stuff, doesn't end up in the hands of an enemy who's using it to harm U.S. forces. So punishing China is on the list, but I think it's just important to remember the rest of the world, especially neutral countries, will definitely appreciate interests one through four. Even if they don't agree with them, they will understand them. What most of the world is not going to be willing to do is impoverish itself to help us punish China. So this is the problem. As Hugo said at the beginning of his remarks, the current state of thinking is basically if China breaks the glass, we're going to do Russia plus in some form. Is this really viable? China's got all the stockpiles, billion barrels, almost a billion barrels of oil in their strategic petroleum reserve, the world's largest food reserves, massive reserves of every raw input you can think of. Their dependence on imports, which looks really large, is actually illusory because they were completely self-sufficient in stuff like meat until they got rich enough to import a uh, nice steak from Australia. Um, US allies would be devastated. That's the finding of all the modeling studies. And South Korea would take you know, something like a 20% hit to GDP if all the trade shut down. What would be the effect to be, what would be the effect in South Korean domestic politics? And finally, just the scale of China's role in the global economy. China makes a third of the world's stuff and they export half of it. And that means that at least in the short term, yes, China is dependent on the world. China needs other folks to buy their stuff. But everyone is dependent on stuff made in China. Bringing that production back is not going to be a quick thing.
And then finally, a reflection on the size of the neutral community. China has what, 14 land borders? 120 odd countries count China as their largest trading partner. That's a whole lot of countries that would want to be neutral and potentially be able to be neutral, helping China transship goods in and out, even if we didn't want them to. All right, if you could just pass that back down, we'll sit down for this bit. So it's very easy to be critical. It's hard to try and come up with an alternative. What we've tried to do here is start a conversation about an alternative. And where do we look? Well, we look at a boat somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. And the reason we do that, and we talk about a meeting between Churchill and Roosevelt in 1941, is that before we can think of the details of plans for what order, what economic process we would like to evolve this to after a Taiwan crisis, we have to think about principles. Very hard to design specific plans for economic shock in advance because you don't know what the shock is or what it looks like. We can play a good game of guess. We can work out the broad incentives and challenges. But a really good starting point is to think of what principles should guide policy planning. And we will highlight four. First, it is not viable to break non-critical supply chains on day one. And private firms are going to need time to reshore. We cannot ask private firms, US private firms, UK private firms, to break this at once. And if we did, the impact on US domestic markets would be catastrophic. Second is the overwhelming importance of the dollar and the need to reassure financial markets. We actually think the dollar will strengthen in a crisis. Um, that's what happens in World War I to the pound because people tend to go risk off and fly to the reserve currency. So, so we're, we're on to a winner already, perhaps, but that has to be a priority. Third principle, it is not viable in the world in which we live to ask third countries to stop trading with China under any circumstances. And in fact, the US and its allies should conceive of what they're doing in a Taiwan crisis as a program of economic response and recovery, not just punishment. In other words, the US should build its coercion into an affirmative vision for the global economy that respects the interests of third states. Finally, any attempt to break US and ally dependence on the Chinese market is going to involve discriminatory trade policy. We're going to be doing it by the first of those two channels I highlighted at the start, right? The national market. That gets you a problem. That problem is transshipment. Everyone has an incentive to buy a Chinese washing machine, cross out the words made in China, right? Made in wherever on it and ship it on. We've already seen this start to happen with the Trump and Biden tariffs. There's some brilliant work that the Peterson Institute has done on the scale of transshipment, if you're interested. Um, the, the figure they put as is the total um, transshipped imports from China in value terms are bigger than our imports from Germany. So the, 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 the incentives here are enormous. And we need to find, this is the essential challenge, we need to find a rules-based system of incentives to encourage neutral states to hit what we think of as the minimum bar, which is honesty of trade reports. If we don't have that, there's very little we can do. So how does this work? Well, we've just written a report with a flashy and provocative image on the top. It's an image of an avalanche. And the policy that we are proposing in a phrase is avalanche decoupling. We're talking about a process which the United States could trigger unilaterally on or shortly after day one, which would not cause mass destruction or confusion on day one, but which would set in motion a process that would gain momentum over time, leading towards full decoupling from China. So how do you actually operationalize this? It's a few things that Congress could do. Now, the mechanics we can get into in terms of the market operations, but it's basically very straightforward to legislate. The first thing you do is you amend section 232 of the Trade Act of 1962. This is, this is the national security exemption that uh, President Trump used uh, for steel and aluminum tariffs, but it's been used before. You, you amend this to say that China poses a systemic national security threat. Now, why do you do that? Because if you do that, 
you can present decoupling from China as consistent with our obligations under the GATS charter, which is the basis of the World Trade Organization. Now, is this in line with spirit of WTO rules? Absolutely not. It's exploiting a loophole and blowing it up to be the size of the moon. But the point is very important. The United States in this moment of crisis and uncertainty would be saying, we are not going to blow up the entire global trading system simply to punish China. We're just designating China a systemic national security threat. We are going to deal with the consequences of that in a measured and rules-based way. The second thing you do is you set up a ratcheting mechanism. This is either a tariff that moves up by, say, a couple of percentage points a month or a quota that ratchets down. It matters that ratchet, once established, is trusted by everyone that it's going to keep going. It matters more that the, the ratchet be difficult to tamper with than that the ratchet move very quickly. But what you're doing is you're sending a message to the marketplace, to the capital markets, or Wall Street, and to private firms, that the time is going to come, be it in X number of years or Y number of years, where you will no longer be able to manufacture anything in China and import it into the U.S. market. So you better get ready. You better find another place to pull your manufacturing back to. And the idea of this is that we're going to set the incentives so that private firms can find the most efficient way to move their supply chains. We are not going to command and control the entire supply chain of everything in the global economy. This is beyond the capacity of the US government. We think this could be coordinated with a core group of US allies. We named Japan, Canada, the UK, and Australia as a potential core, but the core could be flexible. Uh, not all of them have to pursue this in exactly the same way. The point is that they would align their policy with the United States, and this would become a significant share of global demand. If you put these five economies together, it's 40% of global consumption, which would be saying in X number of years from today, we won't buy a thing from China. So this creates a process where the private sector starts to pull back. Finally, working in particular with this core group of allies, you're going to very strongly enforce your export controls on the narrow suite of really critical stuff. And that is where we should be focusing our energy on the small list of items, especially dual use items, that might be going to further the PLA in its purposes. Now, you can imagine other forms of collaboration you can imagine collective resilience against PRC economic warfare. Hugh will speak about this in a minute. The point is, this isn't viable without Congress having a bipartisan consensus. That's why we say, imagine a Drake glass scenario. However, it is not beyond the wit of man to do this. You could actually operationalize it in a bill of a few pages. And this is something that you could write in advance to telegraph to China, and which you could leave on the shelf to implement only after day one. All right, that still leaves you with a transshipment problem. Um, and the way we think of tackling this, you can see a very silly cartoon from the Marshall Plan up there, I'll circle back that in a second. The way we think of tackling this is you create a thing, call this an economic security cooperation board, and you give it two mandates that you intertwine. The first mandate is, this is the US and core ally crisis response vehicle. It's going to have a budget, and it's going to be the means by which the U.S. supports the global economy, which it would want to do anyway, as it did during COVID, as it did during 2008. And this is talking about an economic crisis of that scale, if not larger. But the second part of the mandate is going to be honesty of customs reform. So if a state begins to transship product in increasing volume as the ratcheting trade that I describes goes up, there's three stages. One, further support in customs enforcement. This is gonna be a huge challenge. We are already actually starting to think this way regarding Russia sanctions, um, because places like Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, many of these are becoming systemic transship points. So we're starting to think in this way already. Second stage, okay, this is continuing. Now your access to aid and support through the FCB, which is modeled on the Marshall Plan, with that kind of idea of aid first, starts to get shut off. And then finally, in a rules-based way, okay, you third country have become a sustained transshipment point for Chinese products. 
either in general or in a particular sector, other members of this thing get to treat you like China and impose those tariffs on you too. So in other words, it's about taking the biggest problem we have, which is transshipment, and throwing the biggest carrot and stick combo we have at it, which is ultimately market access, and guiding that through with the US aid and support to a global economic crisis. Because unless we can use our own market to incentivize compliance, we're going to really struggle. But if we can do that, the incentives align for most states to report honesty because they're not being asked to limit their own trade with China. They're not actually being asked to condemn the invasion of Taiwan either. They can say and think whatever they want about the crisis. And this is some feedback we've got from countries we visited to talk to about this. All they are being asked to do is be honest about trade reporting, not make a geopolitical statement. I'm going to come back at the end, but I'll leave this question to I briefly. How does this contribute to deterrence? How much does this contribute to deterrence? Well, the answer is fundamentally we don't know. Because we don't know how much Xi Jinping values the economy, how much he is willing to accept a lot of short-term economic pain. And we don't know how he is being briefed and how he thinks about this idea of systemic risk or the risk of economic or financial meltdown. Um, we have to presume that he cares about it to some degree, but I don't think we should assume that this day one plan that we're proposing is a substitute uh, for the hard power that the Navy and others are out there doing. There's a, there's a multiple sided deterrence problem that we face because we know so little about how she's doing things. And the US government's answer to this is integrated deterrence, an idea that whatever it is he might care about, we should have a plan for holding that at risk. Uh, so we're not saying that this is in any way a substitute uh, for traditional deterrence, but I think it is important. It's important not only because it threatens to impose pain on China, but also because it demonstrates that he could lose control of the pathway of global order in and after a Taiwan crisis. There's just a final chart that I want to make you look at. This is a chart of China's current account surplus. So this is the amount of stuff that they export minus the stuff that they import. And as you can see, in the past two years or so, basically since COVID, this level has boomed. They're now exporting trillions of dollars of stuff a year. Their imports are falling. And that means that they are dumping finished products on the rest of the world. They are essentially buying commodities, low value stuff, they're modifying and capturing the value, and then they're dumping it on the rest of the world. And this means if you are Brazil, if you are Indonesia, if you are Turkey, if you are any country that wants to climb the development ladder, you're going to have a very hard time because whatever it is you want to make, China's probably dumping it subsidized into your market. So what's the pitch? What's the pitch to neutral countries so that it will be in their interest to work with us to clear this minimum bar that Hugo described? The argument, I would say, is in a Taiwan crisis, we're not going to ask you to condemn what China's doing. We're not going to ask you to fight alongside us. But we intend to take the manufacturing jobs back. Would you like some? If you would like some, both to manufacture for yourself and to sell into our market, we're willing to talk. But there are some expectations that you're going to have to meet. And that's abiding by a rules-based system that we are evolving after the crisis. There are a lot of things that China could potentially do in response to this. You can put them in three broad buckets. You can do asset freezes, you can do import controls, you can do export controls. I'm not gonna talk about that too much, we can get into it in questions because I want to open this up to questions. But one thing I'd say is of course, the more you mess with your own market in that way, the more unreliable you make that market and the greater incentives there are on private clubs to reshore. So in many ways, in the long run, if you can set an incentive-led framework up, Chinese economic coercion plays against it in the long run. So to sum up, there's a theoretical debate that we've been getting into in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere that I think is really interesting, which is in our economic contingency planning, are we aiming for certainty or uncertainty? 
And many of those who would advocate a sanctions led approach would argue what we're aiming for is uncertainty. We're aiming for to, 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 to wield the biggest, scariest bazooka we can find, and we probably wouldn't use it, but we maybe would use it, and just the sheer scariness has a deterrent effect. That's okay. The problem with that is that we are the people who would be drawing a red line over Taiwan. We are the people who would be making that call, and there are many pathways that people in this audience will know better than I that are not obvious. And even in those which are obvious, we are the people making that call, and there is a real risk that if we maximize the economic uncertainty, we end up deterring ourselves. And worse, if we then fire that bazooka and do everything we can, and then Taiwan gets into serious difficulty, which is what she might convince himself will happen, the pressure on us to reach an accommodation, if all we've done is negative, is going to be huge. So what we're arguing is that we should aim for, if not certainty, at least a contingency plan that respects the broad suite of US interests. Don't seek just to punish China, but rather look to protect the position of the dollar, sustain macroeconomic stability, provide US private firms and US allies with a coherent path to breaking production over time, and have a coherent affirmative vision of what a global trading system looks like where the US can continue to trade and profit. And if you can put the hard yards in of thinking that through, if you can have those meetings, have those debates, show to China we are taking this problem and threat seriously, and that we understand our own limitations, we would argue that has a greater deterrent effect than threatening the biggest, scariest thing we can think of without looking through the consequences. All right, we're going to stop that. We have just well, over half an hour to really talk about these issues. Um, we are very much looking forward to hearing questions and feedback. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks a bunch, guys, for the, for the comments and for the presentation. For those here in the audience, uh, if you're going to ask questions, I would just ask that you uh, use what I'm doing here, the microphone button, uh, it's, it's so that the uh, folks on the outside can hear what we're saying. Um, listen, I'll start off as just a, a kind of a basic question to get, to get the ball rolling. There's a lot here to chew on. Um, you know, China, as you know, operates right now in the gray zone and is doing increasing actions around Taiwan, its offshore islands, uh, and the pressure has is, is been rationing up ever since the, the Pelosi visit uh, just a couple of years ago. Yeah. I can certainly envision right now in the White House, there are discussions that are going on about what should we do to deter uh, China from going further down this gray zone ladder? Maybe something short of conflict. And I would imagine in the White House that the economic sanctions button is very quickly what they're coming to. It's just the natural thing. It's what we've done for years and years and years. Um, but what I'm hearing, and this is maybe a very simple question for you, but what I'm hearing with the number of neutral states that are out there right now, what I'm hearing from you is that Going down the sanctions route uh, for something even short of conflict, even if we want to bring a bazooka, even if we want to do something pretty hard, the sanctions angle is not going to work based on the economic conditions that we've seen. Is that basically what I should be drawing out of this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very good. We, we even did it in harmony. Um, I think this point about gray zone is really interesting. In the report, we are at pains to draw a distinction that the Biden administration has drawn and between de-risking and decoupling. We should be doing de-risking now, and we should be thinking about what else we need to do to make that effective. Active pharmaceutical ingredients are something that has been highlighted, for example, as something we should be looking to pull back now. We are de-risking from China, China is de-risking from us. That is different to drawing lines in the sand over Taiwan. If you do symbolic sanctions, which is kind of what you're talking about, right? A signal that this is not on. You do two things. One, you demonstrate you're really nervous about sanctions and only doing sanctions you don't think will have an economic effect. And you get everyone used to the idea that sanctions and economics, economic actions are things you do symbolically, not to have a real economic impact. Secondly, every time you use economic sanctions in that of that kind, you are undermining the use of the dollar. I don't think that's a massive concern, 
But it is a relevant factor, particularly as we've seen Russia switch to non-dollar payment mechanisms. So we need to be thinking seriously about de-risking. That's not a deterrence thing. That's a natural contingency planning thing we should be doing now. But we should also be thinking, in a crisis, how and where will we draw the line? And if we draw the line, what do we do? Final point. As we approach that gray zone ladder going up and up and up, everyone is going to start thinking and worrying about what happens if the line is crossed. If our tool is heavy sanctions if the line is crossed, the dominant conversation between the US and allies in third countries is going to be, don't do sanctions, don't do sanctions, don't do sanctions. That will undermine the US position in the gray zone. Because instead of having the conversation we want to have, about Taiwan, about its importance, about what China is doing, we will end up having a conversation we don't want to have about the economic cost of a tool we may or may not use. So having a coherent economic contingency plan for past a day one crisis strengthens the US hand in the gray zone by reassuring allies and supporting a coalition. I agree with everything that Hugo said, but to, to put a, just a finer point on it, I think, Economic threats are not the appropriate way to deter gray zone action, full stop. Yep. The best deterrent for gray zone action is political. What China is doing when it operates in the gray zone is it's testing us, testing our resolve while imposing pressure on Taiwan's democracy. Every time they do that, however, they accept some risk risk that we will misperceive what they're doing and do something in our own relationship with Taiwan that they don't want us to do, bringing about escalation from the gray zone to hot conflict, which is a step change that in the moment they're indicating they don't particularly want. So I would suggest the best way to deter gray zone aggression is to raise the stakes for China by suggesting there's a serious risk that we might misperceive them and do something in our bilateral relationship with Taipei that they don't want us to do. Uh, Susan Fall, I'm a junior student here. Um, say we put your plan into action. How do you expect the PRC to counteract your plan? And with which countries or which countries do you think they will court the most? Can I take this? Yes. Yeah. This is a very important question. Um, Hugo spoke a bit about the negative things that Beijing could do, which they would probably target against the United States and our core allies, um, but th which they would try to use to divide our coalition. The most effective tools that they have uh, for neutral countries, especially if we're doing this economic security cooperation mechanism that Hugo has described, are probably carrots rather than sticks. So my background is as a student of the Belt and Road. Uh, so I'm I'm very conscious that you know Beijing has a worldview about what it is offering third countries. It has made this pitch and built these relationships over the course of a decade. It's thrown a lot of money at it. And while the amount of new projects that it's initiating through the Belt and Road has declined, we shouldn't underestimate how deep some of these relationships run, especially in the Pacific Islands, which would be very relevant in any Taiwan contingency, in Central Asia, which is less relevant, but very important from a natural resource commodity perspective, uh, and in Southeast Asia and Africa, uh, countries that are very, very closely bound up with China in terms of supply chains. Now, all of these countries would have a very hard time complying with the customs stuff that we're talking about, dealing with the transshipment issue. And China could potentially offer them cash on the table to help uh, smuggle goods in and out, laundering them, misrepresenting where they come from. And so it's possible if China moves, we initiate this plan and the avalanche rolls, it's possible that we're not going to get everyone in the Asian region in particular, and Laos and Cambodia come to mind, 
Uh, some Central Asian countries come to mind. However, I think the, the, the point that we would make is we need to come out of the gate with a vision that's acceptable to as many neutral countries as possible. And we need to recognize some of these countries, especially ones that share land borders with China, are going to have a hard time and they're going to need extra help. I think the only thing I would add to that is that in this world, there are some very crude forms of trade policy you can use if you want to stay compliant, but don't trust your own customs enforcement. You can just say, okay, this is coming across from China in such a volume, we're not re-exporting it at all. You can say, on this particular case that we produce ourselves, we want to be really careful about Chinese imports. So you, once you've set the incentive structure in place, people will innovate to meet it. That's the hope. But I think I'd agree with everything Ike said, it's going to be really challenging particularly with countries that, set, countries that share land borders. You can't stop that, but it is in the U.S. interest, and this is why I don't like the term friendshoring. It is in the U.S. interest to establish the widest net and coalition possible and then respond as countries make their own decisions. Trying to pick in advance who our best buddies are in a Taiwan crisis is A, challenging, and B, economically damaging. Because then you're starting to intervene in the global market and make decisions about where supply chains move. And that's not a good idea if we are caring about economic interests as well as political ones. So the purpose of the ESCB and things like it is to allow the market to dictate where supply chains move to in non-critical areas. And then we'll make those decisions. But I would be wary of being too prescriptive beyond some obvious points about Central Southeast Asia and then Pacific Islands. I'd be wary of being too prescriptive about who friends and foes are. Hey guys, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Uh, just a couple questions. One is, you mentioned you had done some research on the lessons that China's drawing from the war in Ukraine and things that we've done right or wrong against Russia. That, that's one question. What do those look like? What, what are they learning from that conflict? And what are they? how are they using that to prepare for a potential future crisis like this one? The second question is, are they in a position to have a more proactive mm -hmm. uh, economic warfare policy or economic warfare plan? We, we always t have this tendency to refer to China as being reactive. They would be reactive. They'd be reacting to our policies, our tariffs, our economic warfare plans. Is it possible that they would not necessarily be reactive, but they've already developed an economic warfare plan? And if so, what could they do and what might that look like and what might we do to defend ourselves against it if it exists? I'll let I take the lead. So two very important questions, um, Ian. And because you actually read the Chinese sources, um, you know as, as well as I do that there's not a lot of good um, authoritative material on how they are thinking about Russia, Ukraine. I think the jury's still out in many respects. I'm supposed to speak uh, at a conference later this week about this question. And I'm racking my brain for how I can spin the limited data points that we have. I think Russia's experience stabilizing its financial system, uh, which I, I showed you that chart earlier, I think that speaks for itself. And a lot of what China's financial regulatory ecosystem has been doing in the last three to four years, this is a process that predates uh, the invasion of Ukraine, by the way, uh, is designed to gain the capability to do what Russia's central bank did so effectively in March and April of 2022 that stabilized the situation. Um, China holds trillions of dollars of foreign currency that they've accumulated through years of running these current account surpluses. And it's it's run by a state institution called SAFE, the State Administration for Foreign Exchange. And SAFE has stopped declaring their level of reserves. It The, the data that they have released most recently doesn't make any sense because they suggest that the, no, the amount of reserves they have is flat, even though their current account surplus is going up. So the data that are publicly reported are cooked. Now you can calculate how much they actually have 
uh, based on some tabulating of the current account surpluses they've had a few years back. And there's a guy, Brad Setzer, at the Council on Foreign Relations, who's done the pathbreaking work here. And he thinks that their uh, reserves are between five and six trillion, so potentially close to double what they say. And they are probably hiding that foreign exchange in their state banking system. Um, but they're keeping it deliberately secret because they don't want us to know how much reserves they have in case we get into some kind of financial fight where we're trying to drain them dry. And this is also so they can signal credibility to the market. Don't test us by like shorting our currency or whatever, because we can, if you, if you sell our currency, we can buy, sell our foreign exchange to buy it back. So to answer your question in, in more simple terms, basically what they're doing is they're accumulating as much foreign currency as they can. They're breaking their dependencies on foreign supply chains as soon as as much as possible. This is the dual circulation story. This is their counterpart to de-risking. They are stockpiling like crazy, food, fuel, refined products, everything they can, um, as well as commodities uh, like uh, uh, ores. They are preparing themselves so that if they were completely shut off from international trade, which we think wouldn't be likely, they could survive for something like six months to a year, uh, fortress China, and be completely fine. Um, in terms of what they've learned about us and our willingness to bear pain, I think we have to assume that they've gained confidence because what they saw is we threw everything we had at Russia basically in the first three weeks. And then with the exception of this oil price cap, We've done hardly anything with respect to Russia sanctions that would tighten the noose around Russia if it was going to raise uh, prices at the pump for U.S. consumers. And that is, a, that is a signal about our unwillingness to bear pain. So maybe Taiwan is a different, different situation, and they're definitely going to prepare for that contingency. But it's one thing to prepare for the worst case scenario, and it's another thing to think about your base case. And I think their base case increasingly is the United States would not be willing to do broad-scale sanctions. Positive visions. We've talked a lot about this. Uh, I'll let the One Belt, One Road experts speak to One Belt, One Road. What I will say is this. There is nothing China can do to get around the structural point that it has to export and export at mass volumes of manufactured goods. Now, that's not quite true. They could do all the reforms that serious economists have been telling them to do for 20 years. Um, I don't see much sign of that. And absent that, and it's that chart we saw about um, where Chinese trade has gone, they have to keep exporting. That shapes and limits the kinds of positive economic statecraft visions they can give. Because what they cannot give is a market of scale for a state moving up that development pathway yet. So, yes, there's lots of things they can do. They can do loans, they can do support. They've shown themselves very inflexible in their economic statecraft so far in those spaces. I can speak more to that than I can. But that sustained dependence on manufacturing exports shapes, defines, limits the affirmative offer they can make. Now, cheap stuff's great. Cheap stuff lowers prices for consumers. You can't say to third countries, cut off from China trade because in five, six, seven years time, you may get a manufacturing boom. However, in the long run, access to US and core markets is a, is a, a tool of statecraft that is more appealing than what China can offer, particularly if those markets are gradually, consistently, calmly moving their trade with China down. And that's the argument of the report. Hugo said it exactly right. The only thing I'd, I'd emphasize is China has this piggy bank full of dollars and other currencies, and there's a finite amount of it. It's a lot, it's trillions of dollars, it's five to six trillion if you believe Brad, but it's a finite amount. If they choose to go down this road with us, that's their war chest. Now they can increase it if they continue to export more than they import, but for the reasons we're describing, that might not happen. So this is a substantial amount of money. If you want to bribe a third country to do this or that, five or six trillion dollars sitting in a piggy bank is a substantial amount that you can play with. But 
that is really the extent of what they're able to offer because they can't offer market access. They can offer investments. They can offer, we will buy a large amount of your stuff in one big go. But what they can't do is change their own model of political economy to make them import more than they export, because that's the thing that we do. And in fact, the whole structure of their system is designed not to do that. So a lot of short-term carrots that they can offer, fewer long-term carrots. And what about the sticks? Are, are there certain things that they export that are strategic? Yes. And if so, what might that look like if they were to stop exporting them? It looks like some very scary supply shocks and some very massive incentives for us to respond very, very quickly. Um, we are already starting to see movement in this space. At the extreme end, I mentioned APIs earlier, there is more to do and there is more to do now. In general, export controls are a difficult tool for the Chinese state to use because you are limiting your own exports and as a result, harming your own model of political economy. There are some things, they, there are some dependencies, many dependencies that are very, very scary. But if they start to restrict those, we get a massive incentive to build them up. One of the things we talk about with the Economic Security Cooperation Board is collective resilience against PRC aggression. So what you could do as part of the US aid and, aid and response package to a global economic crisis is say, if you join the ESCB, you don't need to condemn Taiwan, you don't need to go from China. But if China starts coercing you, here is a pot of money that you can draw on to help resist. So there's things we can do to offer that kind of collective insurance against Chinese sticks. Um, I happen to think that's a very effective thing to do. It is actually something we could do now at a lower level. This is exactly right. Just a couple of examples that uh, folks in this room may have thought about. The first is the 2010 rare earths embargo. China at this point was producing over 90% of the, of the world's refined uh, rare earth alloy output. They decide, you know what? We're not gonna export it to the US and Europe anymore. Well, what happened? Prices outside China skyrocketed. You saw a whole bunch of private investment. And then you saw the development of new supply outside China. And over time, uh, the prices re-equilibrated because the demand outside China adjusted. Supply and demand actually adjusted. When prices go up, people will demand less of a thing. They'll figure out ways to use something else to substitute or to use it more efficiently. Um, and over time, new supply will come online. So in a sense, it's a, it's a weapon that you get to use once and then it loses its efficacy. And this is why China has actually been pretty cautious about using these uh, export controls in peacetime. Uh, you may have seen headlines uh, about, about a year ago now about the gallium and germanium exports. These are two uh, inputs that are important in chip making. And China did a whole song and dance about how it was gonna restrict these exports, but it didn't really do it. They wrote those rules so narrowly that it didn't really disrupt global supply. The reason is they didn't want the world to stop being dependent on China and gallium and germanium. And that's what, what would have happened. So in a conflict scenario, I think we should assume anything that is, a, is an input for a critical dual use um, uh, thing that we're making outside China, they might manipulate export controls for. The solution on a lot of this stuff is just stockpiling. And as Hugo indicated, sometimes joint stockpiling is the smartest way to do it, to get together with a group of uh, friendly countries and say, let's build a shared stockpile of whatever it is. Applied pharmaceutical ingredients, which is the inputs you need to make life-saving drugs. This is harder because a lot of this stuff has a shelf life. We all know prescription medication expires. So this is the, an example of something where you might actually want to bring manufacturing out of China uh, pre-crisis. But like writ large, they have to be pretty selective about how they do this. Not only because, as Hugo said, it would incentivize everyone to say, well, we can't trust their market. Private companies are going to say, we got to pull our production out even faster. Um, but also because they would push countries on a political level towards the United States and into the coalition if we're offering them a sort of insurance policy against China's economic coercion. Sorry, one more point. When China exports a product, it's really hard for China to see where it goes. So China can say, 
the United States is evil, we're not exporting X developed product to the United States. If it exports that product to, oh, I don't know, Sierra Leone, there is nothing China can do to stop Sierra Leone ex re-exporting that product to the United States. In other words, China faces the same problems we face in economic coercion backwards. So there are limits to the extent to which China can target export controls at individual markets, because they have the same transshipment problem, if they try to do that, that we would do restricting China's imports. So there are some structural challenges there that are very difficult to overcome. Are there questions online, I wonder, as well? If not, I have more questions. I'll just <laughs> you guys. Keep them coming. Um, what is, what are your views on the potential for in a Taiwan crisis? There have been a lot of estimates that have been done about how devastating that could be to our economy, to the global economy. Have you guys looked at it? I'm sure you have uh, looked at those. What are your views on that? And then the other, and my final question, I promise, um, you mentioned that there were some sticks that China had that were potentially devastating. You kind of had a, a could you give us a, a top five or a top 10 list of things that we'd be very wise to de-risk from right now, in addition to yeah. pharmaceuticals? I'll let I go on to the second question. Um, you're referring to the Bloomberg analysis on Taiwan crises, is that what you're talking about? Among, sure. yes. Among others. I have a very blunt response to this, which is A, we don't know. And B, this exercise is kind of silly because a lot of the economic impact of a Taiwan crisis depends on what we would do in response. So if you start trying to estimate the economic impact of a Taiwan crisis and then work backwards to what we would do, you're getting into a very silly logical bind. We get to determine what the economic impact of a Taiwan crisis is. What, where I think this is fascinating is looking at shipping and looking at trade disruptions and trade shocks. And that's a lot of what has been done. That's really interesting. It is really, really hard to model. But you can do some interesting stuff there. But I'm wary about going too far down the precise estimate of economic impact of a Taiwan crisis lane. Firstly, because of its sheer complexity, but above all, because it, it sort of underestimates the extent to which we have agency to shape what those economic costs are and how they run. And so it is, to me, more sensible when we're thinking about our own contingency planning to start from principles and frameworks uh, that we would use rather than starting from estimations of the impact of something that we control. I'd, I'd echo that. Um, with I have a lot of respect for the work that economists are doing on this subject, but the fact is uh, a shock of this scale is very difficult to model uh, precisely because the mechanisms that we're talking about as historians is that when prices move in the way that we're talking about, there's adaptation pressure. And figuring out the speed of that adaptation is very, very difficult. And, you know, the, the Federal Reserve struggled with this question and how to deal with inflation. You know, COVID-19 created supply chain shocks and this created shortages and it led to higher prices. Just how long would it take for that to abate and how big of a story was that relative to the other um, things that were infecting inflation. This is something that, you know, the, the smartest economists who have had, who have all of the data are struggling to figure out as a historical question, looking backwards. So the, the idea that we could uh, come up with precise estimates is just, I think it's, it's fantasy. What we can see, and the Bloomberg model is helpful on this, is like very, very roughly, who is more vulnerable than who? And relatively speaking, will most of the pain from the shock come from loss of access to Taiwan's semiconductors, loss of access to stuff made in China, loss of access to stuff made in South Korea that can't get out? So I think this chart directionally probably tells us something you very useful information. But I think the key thing is that Everyone in Northeast Asia is going to have a really, really, really hard time for as long as they're shooting. And if we manage to curtail China's imports and exports, if that's something we wanted to do and we could do, 
that is also something that would hurt Northeast Asia and Australia much more than co countries like the United States and the UK. Nevertheless, it would be a huge body blow to our economy. I think we can't really get more fine grained than that. And then on the question of uh, what should we be thinking about de-risking and reshoring, generally speaking, I think the answer to the critical mineral stuff is they're building stockpiles, we should build a stockpile, and we should diversify ourselves by doing it together with allies. The other thing that we have to focus on are machine tools and these intermediate electronic components that you and I would never have actually seen or know the name of, because it's just one component as part of a broader component of part of a device that makes other devices. There's a lot of electronics production that happens in China, uh, but also a lot of production of machine tools for electronics. And I would be worried that there might be some component which is mission critical on some US defense platform. And the tool that makes the tool is acquired by a sub, 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 subcontractor from a company in the PRC. And it will take three years to build the factory that can make more of that stuff. So do more, doing more auditing of defense supply chains, I think is the next step. We will get more fine grained answers after we do that. Can I two finger on this one? Uh, and maybe using the same chart. We've been talking US and China and uh, obviously the scenarios that you guys have been uh, addressing. Um, but, uh, but I wanna bore down specifically to the China-Taiwan angle itself. And the question I wanna get at is, what should Taiwan be doing right now to mitigate some of the economic coercive tools that the PRC might be trying to put on them? Presumably, looking at this chart, you know, the need for global semiconductors is going to be a mitigating tool that will allow Taiwan to withstand this pressure. Or does this model that you've laid out between U.S. and China, does it apply to just if you want to bring it down narrowly to a China-Taiwan cross-strait thing? Is it applicable there, too? If that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. We all know by now that the world is really dependent on su supply chains from Taiwan. Taiwan makes these chips, they make like 40% of the world's chips, but they also make 90% of the high-end chips. And in a world in which Taiwan is blockaded, which we know from CMSI research is basically any scenario in which Taiwan is being attacked, uh, chip exports, if not chip production, probably falls to zero right away. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, 20% of Taiwan's energy consumption is industry. And if Taiwan loses access to reliable energy imports, this is a country that imports close to all of its energy. So the first thing they're doing is shutting down the non-critical stuff, which includes grounding civilian flights and shutting off industry. That has an immediate effect on the global financial system and global supply chains. Now, from Taiwan's perspective, that's actually probably advantageous. It puts a bit of a squeeze if they're under blockade on us, on the Japanese, on the British, on everyone else to figure out a way to get them out of blockade. Um, but it also will put a lot of neutral countries in a difficult position. And it does raise the, the risk that neutral countries would just say, I'm feeling economic pain. Anything we can do to get these, these factories back online and get me to get my chips back is something that I'll support, even if that means reasoning my way towards supporting Beijing's position. So I think there's a risk that things could go both ways. Yeah. Now, Taiwan has to do what it has to do for its own defense. One of the things that they should do is build larger reserves of coal, petroleum, you know, all, all of the energy stuff. They can definitely invest in the resilience of their grid and they can build larger uh, reserves of primary energy. Um, the food stuff is less of a concern. Another thing that Taiwan may need to do is stockpiling machine tools because Taiwan has an indigenous defense industrial base. That might be very difficult to resupply in a, in a crisis scenario. They might be on their own. And uh, I'm sure you know, Ian and others on the team will know much more about this. Yeah, um, a few things to add. It is not in China's interest to be seen as the economic aggressor in a Taiwan crisis. So when we're thinking about blockade and quarantine scenarios and economic coercion, 
the best outcome for China is that it can demonstrate that it is Taiwan or the United States taking measures harming the global economy. I would therefore be quite surprised if China attempted to restrict chip exports, because that is just not a sensible thing for China to do. If it is a thing that Taiwan does, that creates some coalition problems. Similarly, we shouldn't forget that Taiwan's one of Taiwan's most significant, if not most significant trading partner is China. And that relationship, China would want to continue through any Taiwan crisis. So when I think about blockade and quarantine scenarios, I'm looking much more at ways China might seek to intervene in Taiwan's trade with the United States or with the West, or draw theoretical lines in the sand that present a long-term problem for the future of Taiwanese um, society, but minimize economic disruption. And those are much scarier problems for the United States, to me, than attempts by China to actively restrict Taiwan's participation in the global economy. Because if China does that, I think we can be pretty confident in having a strong pitch to ask to ask the global community to support us in asking China to back off. But there are other scenarios. The nightmare one to me is always, we are concerned that the US is increasing weapons shipments to Taiwan. We therefore reserve the right to inspect ships trading into Taiwan from the United States and allies to inspect weapons shipments. Now, there's no way we can tolerate that standing. But you don't have to do any economic disruption to do that. And so that's what I meant in the conclusion about us being the ones drawing a line in the sand. And I think we need to approach this planning with an awareness that we are the people who will be doing a lot of the economic disruption in many circumstances. And we need to, we need to think about that. We need to plan for that. That has relevance to Ike's question about political deterrence in the gray zone as well. Well, gentlemen, listen, I want to say thank you very, very much. I unfortunately, don't have a system where people can ask from online. I'm sure there are lots of questions that are coming online. Uh, they're going to have to just uh, figure out how to get hold of you guys later. And to read and download your report, uh, which is which is available on, is it on the Hoover website? It's on the Hoover website. Um, Ike and I, my emails are also on our respective websites as well. So if people online have questions, just drop us lines. Awesome. Listen, I want to say yeah, thanks to you guys for just an absolutely provocative discussion. And I really hope this is getting the ears of the folks that need to hear it. So if you could all just join me in quick saying thanks. Jamie.